In the mid-1930s in the USSR, the agronomist Trofim Lysenko won the support of Joseph Stalin for his pseudoscientific theories around agriculture, claiming he could drastically increase crop yields with his theories, which rejected Mendelian genetics and natural selection. This prospect was extremely desirable to Stalin after his classicide of wealthy peasants and failed collectivization efforts resulting in the Soviet famine of the 1930s. Scientists who criticized the pseudoscience, including his former mentor, were sent to labor camps or executed, and all criticism of Lysenkoism was ruthlessly suppressed. Lysenko's theories not only contributed to the Soviet famines continuing, but greatly contributed to the Great Chinese Famine after Mao's adoption of his methods. The term Lysenkoism was later coined as any deliberate distortion of scientific facts or theories for purposes that are deemed politically, religiously, or socially desirable. In nearly all dictatorships and totalitarian governments, we see the same sort of pattern play out. Ideology takes precedence over truth, dissent is ruthlessly suppressed, and disaster occurs. But I think it's a bit harder to identify this anti-intellectualism when it occurs in smaller scales and within democratic institutions. But silencing dissent and censoring information are usually the first steps towards authoritarian rule and a lack of human freedom and rights. A less severe but more recent instance of trying to silence certain truths and discredit them by attaching political ideology to otherwise neutral claims occurred in the 1970s in response to biologist E.O. Wilson's observations on social behavior of animals. In his seminal book, Sociobiology, The New Synthesis, E.O. Wilson spends nearly 700 pages discussing the social behavior of different species and their basis in Mendelian genetics and natural selection. In the very last chapter, he suggests that genes could play a role in the social behavior of humans and their differences between one another, and that we are also shaped by natural selection. It's important to note that at this time in sociology and social sciences, tabula rasa was the given ideology or belief about human nature, and tabula rasa is the belief that everyone is born a blank slate, that we are all nurture and no nature, that genes don't play a role on human behavior or qualities like intelligence or charm or other kind of social behaviors that humans have and display amongst each other. And by suggesting in his book that humans are a mixture of both nature and nurture and that genes do play a role in human behavior, E.O. Wilson was basically pariahed. He was challenging the dominant notions of the time and while a lot of people did praise him for his amazing book, there were a subgroup of biologists at his university, Harvard, who were Marxist politically and believed that this view was a threat to their ideology and could lead to disaster to humankind. And as a result, an open letter was written against him and students began demonstrating against him to try and silence him and his ideas. Later on in 2002, Steven Pinker wrote his book, The Blank Slate, where he argues against the notion of the blank slate and revisits the moral panic of the time around E.O. Wilson and his scientific literature and how Wilson was called a fascist, a racist, a eugenicist, and so on, even though he never mentioned race whatsoever in his book and how protesters would charge the stage and chant, racist Wilson, you can't hide, we charge you with genocide and accused him of wanting to bring science back to the concentration camps. The most important part of this story to me, however, isn't how closely these sort of demonstrations mimic what we see today on college campuses and on the internet in terms of cancel culture, but that it exemplifies the problem of tying in ideology and morality and politics into every other area of knowledge. The Marxist biologists and students who attacked E.O. Wilson believed that if genes played a role in human behavior, that this would be used to justify racial superiority, not Nazism, genocide, all of that kind of thing. But what's most interesting about this, and Steven Pinker writes about this in his book, and it's extremely gruesome and dark, but E.O. Wilson's book literally was published the same year as the Cambodian genocide, where the view of tabula rasa was used to genocide all the Cambodians, particularly targeting intellectuals, in order to start the entire country over from year zero, due to the belief that corruption was fully culturally generated, and if we got rid of all the people and started over, and everyone began at a blank slate, we could create a better agrarian socialist society. Ideological interpretations of the data in this case could be used to either justify the Nazi regime or the Khmer Rouge, which just shows how subjective censorship is and how subjective moral justification of facts can be. And Steven Pinker talks about this in The Blank Slate, stating, Though both Nazi and Marxist ideologies led to industrial scale killing, their biological and psychological theories were opposites. And rather than detach the moral doctrines from the scientific ones, which would ensure that the clock would not be turned back no matter what came out of the lab and field, many intellectuals, including some of the world's most famous scientists, made every effort to connect the two. 
All right, and you might be thinking now, okay, Claire, what does all this dark and extreme stuff have to do with cancel culture? Are you really trying to claim that cancel culture is as bad as like genocide? Obviously I'm not, but let me explain how this all kind of ties in and how I feel like cancel culture is potentially a tool used by the establishment and also people, which is why it's so interesting. It's both top down and bottom up to suppress dissent and to allow ideology, even ideology irrespective of fact, to flourish in our society and why I view this as concerning. So we see this politicization of knowledge very keenly in America today, though it is very different from the kind seen in the Soviet Union or Nazi Germany because we do still have political pluralism, free speech, the democratic vote, and other rights that get stripped away as soon as dictatorships or insurgencies come about in society. At the same time, however, we've seen political polarization hit extremely concerning levels with both the far left and the far right getting more and more extreme and also taking over practically all political discussion and conversation. We're also globally seeing a backsliding of democracy and a rise in authoritarianism in many different parts of the world. And here in the West, we're seeing an extremely relaxed attitude towards violence being used to suppress speech and dissident, as well as government suppressing speech and dissident that they don't agree with or like. And that's extremely concerning to me. People are becoming more ideological and ideology is cemented in once respected institutions such as higher education, where for instance, any outcome among identity groups has to be chalked up to, so to structural oppression. Any differences between men and women have to be because of the patriarchy. If you wanna note different personality traits or interests that you see in averages when it comes to men and women and talk about how this might have a role on why STEM fields are overrepresented by men and nursing and teaching are overrepresented by women, this is totally taboo. You are not allowed to say that. It means that you are sexist. I've talked about this before in my video on feminism, but that's just one kind of example of the sort of ideological interpretations that are allowed within certain structures. Other interpretations will get you banished, basically. And at this point, identity politics has hit the hard sciences as well, with math being declared racist, standards being lowered, viewing objective truths or objective answers to math problems as encouraging white supremacy culture and so on. And I'll talk about how education is suffering towards the end of this video, not just college education, but education worldwide, since that is kind of the theme of the video. But I do want to say that when it comes to cancel culture, which is the public ostracization of an individual from a professional or social group, the issue isn't that people are expressing their opinions on what they find offensive or unacceptable or damaging or harmful, etc. Obviously, people have every right to voice those concerns and people should voice their concerns about things that should you know, lead to discussions and dialogue and so on. The speech itself isn't the issue. The issue is that that speech is being used to suppress and silence others. It also seems that institutions immediately bend and cater towards the mob every single time that they act up, regardless of the value of the claims that they're making. People are fired over false claims. People are fired over things that are literally non-issues. And institutions and people at large seem to immediately place precedence of offended people's feelings over what actually happened, the truth of the matter, what's right, what's just, and so on and so forth. The result of college campus outbursts have overwhelmingly been the silencing and suppressing of others. And even on minor things, like I was saying, the Washington Post like a couple weeks ago fired one of their journalists or put him on admin leave for a month or something because another journalist got mad that he retweeted a joke that she found offensive. Like how is this the world right now? But that's how it is kind of widespread everywhere. And the worst aspect of all of it, all of the cancel culture stuff, of course, is the chilling effect it has on people. It makes people afraid to speak out, it makes people afraid to share their own opinions and views on things, even when they have very reasonable views, and even when the dominant view is harmful or just completely dishonest. And this is because the risk of disagreeing with those views is too great for individuals, a lot of individuals to bear. And so people just choose to stay silent because they don't know what the potential consequence will be. And to kind of illustrate this and how social media plays a role in all of this, I want to use a little clip of Jonathan Haidt speaking about this. You know, there have been hundreds of articles about how bad social media is and it's destroying this and that. I think what I'm trying to add here is as a social psychologist, I study morality and politics and I, um, I've become a big fan of, John, of the philosopher John Stuart Mill, who said, he who knows only his own side of the case knows little of that. That is, in order to really understand anything, we have to look at it from multiple perspectives. We have to have different viewpoints pushing against each other. That's what we do in universities. Um, and that's what we've always done in my career as a professor. 
until around 2014, 2015. And all of a sudden, it became much more hazardous to question. If you questioned, if you even tweeted about a study that challenged the received wisdom on race, gender, uh, transgender, there are a couple of, of, of sacred issues. Um, if you even suggested that there was another side, huge social sanctions would rain down on you on Twitter and other platforms. And here's the key thing. When people feel even a little bit of intimidation, when they think, if I speak up, terrible things are going to happen to me of unknown size, like it could be nothing, it could be a thousand tweets. Mm. Um, it's that little bit of intimidation. That's what makes people go silent. And when critics go silent, the group gets stupid. What I find the most interesting about cancel culture, though, in comparison to other forms of censorship, is just how bottom up it is, how it's just as bottom up as it is top down. You can literally be a professor and get fired, both because a 13 year old is tweeting at you from their bedroom and because the Ivy League administrators are firing you based on a bunch of 13 year olds tweeting about you in their bedroom. Both Ivy League administrations and standard civilians can ostracize and destroy a person's career for the same reasons in completely different parts of the world. And the fact that social media makes information so widely available and disseminates so quick and that outrage gets clicks and retweets and so on before people have time to really look at both sides of an argument or anything like that is that it really leads to a collective illusion and a greater amount of collective illusion going on in society. And a collective illusion is a belief that people think the majority of people hold when it actually isn't. And we see this all the time because things are so extreme. A lot of the dominant politics that's being shouted out by both sides is not what the majority of people think. It's a very fringe minority on both sides but people are afraid to speak out and they feel like they are alone in their thoughts and beliefs because they think that the majority of people agree with these two sides when they don't. And it really starts to influence people to try to pick one tribe or another out of fear of being harassed or left out in some way or another or being accused of being on the side of evil. Watch my death to centrist video, please. <laughs> Basically, extremists frighten other people to stay silent. And we also see minority ideological groups claim to speak for the will of the people when the evidence points to the contrary. But unfortunately, these sort of tyrannical and narcissistic and extreme people are what is promulgated in society, both by institutions, the internet, the media, politics, everything. And it's just, it's a weird time in America. <laughs> if you're in America, you know what I'm talking about. It reminds me of that George Carlin quote where he talks about being born in America is like having a front row seat to the crazy show. And I always thought that's not true, you know, there's gotta be some other place that's crazier, but I mean, things are pretty crazy right now. Like I think that quote is really ringing true in the political theater of the world at least. But cancel culture is anti-intellectual in the sense that it silences opposing viewpoints and crushes political dissent. It crushes out nuance. It's used to prop up ideology rather than truth and it creates a distorted view of what the majority of people think. But most of all, of course, it limits public discourse, academic freedom, what people are allowed to study and what they're allowed to say in different institutions, and it encourages people to be more tribal and stick to ideological groups rather than think outside of the box or think critically about the world around them. But the next anti-intellectual aspect of cancel culture I wanna talk about is the shift towards speaking to the most sensitive person rather than the reasonable person standard. And what I mean by teaching or speaking to the reasonable person standard versus the overly sensitive person standard is the idea that if you're a teacher or a professor or an academic or whoever, whoever you are trying to communicate a viewpoint or an idea, you generally do so to the reasonable person standard where a reasonable person will take what you have to say they're not going to immediately assume malintent. They're going to use some some element of faculty of reason to try and understand your view. And they're not going to get overly offended or emotional unless you say something that a reasonable person would find overly offensive and anger inducing and so on. Just a regular person. You're teaching to a regular person. But now professors feel like they're walking on eggshells in classrooms and they've started teaching to the sensitive person standard where they basically are doing their best not to offend what could potentially be the most overly sensitive and offended person in the room. And this is really restricting what people feel like they can say. It's restricting subjects people feel like they could teach and materials they think that they could teach. And it's overall watering down the quality of education and the amount of different nuanced topics students can explore. As I've talked about in other videos, I'm friends with a lot of teachers and I talk to them frequently. And every year it seems like they're emitting more and more course material. They're becoming more and more afraid of their students and of being reported for 
random offhand comments or maybe introducing material that's more provocative and nuanced than the every year becoming more immature students can handle. And the most common material that teachers are afraid to teach or are starting to omit from their classrooms usually deal with racial or sexual themes such as Roots or The Bluest Eye by Toni Morrison, which is ironic because people talk all the time about how black history needs to be taught more frequently in schools and understanding the black experience and everything. But the fact of the matter is because these types of books and like this element of history is so, I guess, dark and nuanced and controversial, people who don't wanna offend students are simply not teaching anymore because it's just too much of a risk. They don't wanna deal with apparent complaints, students being offended, people taking things the wrong way, misinterpreting the text. I was speaking with a middle school history teacher lately who is afraid or like feels a little bit, yeah, walking on eggshells whenever he teaches about slavery and the civil rights movement because he has to talk about the economic aspect of it and how in part the South was fighting for economic reasons to keep slaves because he has a fear like, what if the students think that I'm, you know, justifying slavery and so on. Like that's where we're at today. And obviously, you know, if you're a teacher, you should still be teaching the things that you need to teach regardless. But a lot of people don't want to risk their jobs, obviously. I mean, that's your livelihood. That teacher is also tentative about showing the movie Glory um, because it uses the N-word a lot. That's also a common theme. Any literature with the N-word or anything, forget Huckleberry Finn, that is canceled. And if you're far removed from the education system, this might all sound really crazy to you, but seriously, talk to teachers. It's going on all the time. People are really teaching to the sensitive person standard. This is also seen in university systems where students can anonymously report their teachers for bias or offensive comments and so on, hate crimes, do so anonymously. And this often immediately results in teachers being put on admin leave or fired to read a quote from the Bible of my channel, Coddling of the American Mind, Jonathan Haidt states, the professor asks the class to engage in a discussion of a controversial topic to be chosen by the class. The topic that the students chose was transgender issues. One of the biggest stories that semester had been the revelation of Caitlyn Jenner's identity as a trans woman. Jensen suggested that students read an article about parents objecting to a transgender high school student using the girls' locker room. He explained that although most of the students might not agree with these skeptical views, in academia, Grappling with difficult and controversial perspectives is expected, so it was important that even these viewpoints be discussed. Jensen later recalled the conversation as a very nice discussion of seeing other perspectives. He was surprised when he learned that a student had filed a biased incident report against him. He was advised to avoid the topic of the transgender issues for the rest of the semester and was ultimately not rehired. The bureaucratic innovation of bias response tools may be well intended, but they can have the unintended negative effect of creating an us versus them campus climate that results in hypervigilance and reduced trust. Some professors end up concluding that it isn't worth the risk of having to appear before a bureaucratic panel, so it's better to just eliminate any material from the syllabus or lecture that could lead to a complaint. Then, as more and more professors shy away from potentially provocative materials and discussion topics, their students miss out on opportunities to develop intellectual anti-fragility. As a result, they may come to find even more material offensive and require even more protection. And similarly to the teacher who's tentative about showing the movie Glory to his classroom, there have been instances of teachers being fired or overusing the N-word, or even just words that sound like the N-word in context of legal documents, or even explaining the Chinese filler word that sounds like the word. But this is what I mean when I say cancel culture crushes out nuance. Context doesn't matter anymore. Forget reading Huckleberry Finn. Apparently, even if you utter a word in context, that doesn't even matter. Immediately you're fired, terminated, put on leave, etc. There is no due process. It's completely unreasonable and makes no sense. But this is what I mean when I say if one student gets offended, for some reason, the immediate reaction is to just put that student's feelings over reason and over justice. It makes no sense and it just makes these young generations, my generation included, even more and more hypersensitive, hypervigilant, narcissistic, and authoritarian. I mean, it's like, there's a bunch of little 20 year old authoritarians running out around there, okay? <laughs> but students are treated and spoken to as if they're stupid and sensitive and it's because they are. People have to dumb things down. They have to avoid controversial and nuanced topics. They have to walk on eggshells around people, not just teachers and students, okay, that's one example, but just in regular political life, just regular, not even political life, just at work. People have to be afraid of what words they use, what jokes they make, who's gonna get offended by what, if you look at someone for too long, is that sexual harassment? It just, everything is crazy. But to conclude, cancel culture in and of itself isn't necessarily the greatest threat to democracy and the free exchange of ideas, but I think when it's mixed in with this political extremism, with ideology, with people being increasingly offended by things, 
I think it definitely has the potential to lead to that. Seeking knowledge for knowledge's sake almost necessarily entails uncovering truths that are controversial for a time, aren't politically ideal, or can be utilized and propagandized by ideologues to put forth and implement their views. And because we're in such a politically polarized time in America where absolutely everything is political, everything's seen that way, you can't seek out knowledge for its own sake, it always has to be in service of some other political goal, it seems. Cancel culture makes the risk of bringing forth innovative ideas or even asking simple, honest questions too great to bear because the social sanctions are too much. And the watering down of the education system and the inability to teach offensive or controversial material is really dumbing down the education system. It's making people lack critical thinking skills. It's also making us more likely to repeat the ills of history because we're not allowed to get a full view on controversial topics like Nazism, slavery, all of these kinds of things because we're not allowed to sort of empathize with people who are struggling on the opposite sides of things or understand how ideologies take place because to understand an ideology in today's day and age means that you automatically agree with it which makes no sense, but people are afraid to explore themselves and each other intellectually. They're afraid to explore the world intellectually because of what it might uncover and what that will mean in terms of social ostracization and so on. And I'm just concerned in general about how all of this is going to go down if eventually an ideology will use violent means to suppress all dissent and take power, like we see in so many other societies all the time. Or if this thing's going to explode or implode in on itself, and it's all just gonna go away and things are going to change and political pluralism and democracy and all of these things will stay intact. I honestly don't know. I don't know what's gonna happen. Let me know your predictions down below. But that's my video. I hope this wasn't too much of a mess. I hope it made sense at least a little bit or was a bit cathartic or literally anything, anything positive. <laughs> Sorry that again, I have been gone for like three months. Um, like I say every time, I'm gonna start uploading again more frequently, okay? I have a lot of scripts and stuff. I have a lot of stuff planned. But yeah, subscribe if you like this video, leave a thumbs up and a comment, and I will see you in the next upload. Bye.